Hello, um, welcome to the session titled Get Reading Right for All Students. Today we have joining us Kate B. Camillo and Tasha Squires. Um, this session is going to discuss evidence-based practices, supports and strategies to ensure all students get the reading support they urgently need. Um, my name is Donna Gray and I am a library coordinator with New York City School Library Services. And we have with us Kate DiCamillo, who is one of America's most revered storytellers. She's a former national ambassador for young people's literature and a two-time Newbery medalist. Born in Philadelphia, she grew up in Florida and now lives in Minneapolis. So welcome, Kate. And we also have joining us Tasha Squires, um, 2015 Follett Challenge winner. Tasha started her career as a young adult librarian in a large public library district serving a diverse southwestern suburb of Chicago, Illinois, where she spent many hours book talking and working with middle school and high school in that area. Um, she's the creator and main contributor of the blog, Books in the Middle, WordPress.com, as well as a book talking podcast of the same name. And I'd like to just welcome everyone to this session and get started with questions. So first question goes to Kate. Um, can you tell us a little about yourself and what was an early experience where you learned that language and reading had power? Oh boy. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, and myself always starts with language as power because, you know, I've been actually, it, it, I've been talking about this quite a bit and I have lots of different stories about realizing how much power there was in words. But um, I, the, the most recent book that I published is The Beatrice Prophecy and it's so much about the power of the written word and stories. And so for me, uh, uh, one of the pivotal moments of my life was um, going to school and, um, and expecting to learn how to read at the very first day of first grade, which is when we were taught to read. Then and um, I was just desperate and hungry for it. I had a mother who read to me all the time, and a brother who read to me, um, and I, books were around all the time. But I was not one of those kids who just taught themselves how to read. And so I went off to school, and um, not only didn't learn to read on the first day, but um, was presented with phonics, which uh, for whatever reason made no sense to me. And I remember coming home hysterical um, uh, and. Uh, just crying to my mother saying, I want this so much and I don't understand what they're talking about. And my mother uh, said, uh, for the love of Pete, calm down. Um, we'll, just, uh, we'll just work around it. And she made me flashcards um, and I um, memorized each word on the flashcard and that's how I learned how to read. And every word to me felt like, um, it was just a doorway to a lighted room. And I just knew that's where I needed to be. And I, I, my mother isn't alive anymore, um, but I, I wish that I could thank her again and again for that gift that she gave to me. And that so many teachers and parents give to their kids. It's what I needed to become myself was language and books. Was that too long an answer? I think it was the perfect one. <laughs> That, that answer goes into the question that I have for Tasha because your mom provided support to you when she saw that you were struggling. So my question for Tasha is working with middle school students, um, what kind of advice do you, can you offer to educators that support them in helping students see themselves as readers? Because it's not always easy. People just don't pick up a book and say, I have it. So what advice can you provide? So that's really interesting what Kate just said, because obviously she did not see herself as a reader almost on day one <laughs> when she thought she would be learning how to read. And I think that that's really at the core that students have to see themselves being successful at reading before they will actually see themselves as readers. And I think that we know as educators that kids come to us with all different levels of abilities. And this was driven really home to me when I was working in the public library. And I got a call from a high school teacher who said, hey, we want you to come and book, to our, book talk to our students in ninth grade. And I was like, fabulous, this will be great. And I said, what do you want me to book talk on? And she said, well, 
just so you know, our kids are reading at a second grade reading level. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I don't have anything for your children. I felt terrible. And it was probably one of the defining moments when I was a librarian to realize just how diverse kids are as readers at all different ages. And so the question is, how do we create successful readers? And we have to really, to me, it's super important that we give them different formats than those that they may be used to getting, especially as they get older. For whatever reason, when we start them with reading, we encourage them to try different formats. But I feel like as they get older, it's almost like we pull those away from them. So I know at my library, when I had that situation with that high school teacher, I realized, okay, wait a second, I need to, I need to support these kids and I don't have anything. So I came across these amazing books. Um, I have a couple to show. Um, these are what I now call quick reads and they are incredible. There are several publishers that do these things. Um, one is Orca Soundings or Orca and another one is Saddleback and they are they give a different format for kids that may be struggling to access the books. That, and I'll talk more about accessibility, but they may be struggling with the typical format that we see. So the other thing that I believe very strongly is some, I know we have some teachers that don't believe in graphic novels and allowing kids to read graphic novels and counting that as a book read. But if that's how you get the kid to be successful at reading a book, that's really in really important for them. Letting students listen to an audiobook, or even better, having the students read the book and listen to the audio at the same time. Now, I know a lot of us have heard about audiobooks, and we obviously know about books, but the really cool thing is now there is a publisher who some of you may have heard of, especially librarians out there have heard about Playaways, and of course, we're used to books on CD which of course are phasing out, unfortunately, because technology keeps changing. Um, but this is a new thing that I was just brought uh, to my attention. This is by Wonder Books. And they have the audio right embedded in the book. So that was incredibly exciting for me to see that. So this is just, I feel like another way that we can help our kids be successful. And then uh, once again, another incredible format that I have found extremely effective and successful with my students is the large print format. And students in my school over the last five years or so have consistently shown me that they gravitate toward books that are in large print. We expose them to large print in seventh grade. And as soon as they know this format is available to them and that it helps them be successful, that's where they go. So the short answer to your question is I think we have to be open to allowing students to find what works for them, for them to be successful. And that is not always a traditional regular print text version of a book. Otherwise, I think they will always struggle to see themselves as readers. Thank you for that, Tasha. And I think to that point, you mentioned student choice, um, students find themselves as readers. I think it's important that we give them other formats, right? So yes, we have um, in New York City, wonder books that are being oh, great. to my library NYC. So all of the folks out there who are part of that program, um, you can actually access wonder books through my library NYC. And we also have um, large print as well. And I think you don't always, you don't know what you don't know. Um, right, right. Out, Very true. <laughs> right? So once you figure out large print is something that it's not just for people who might have like a sight issue or just might need like it's not just for older folks. Like, right. Large print is for everyone. And once, it really is. Yeah, once you break that barrier, it's like, hey, like, here's the same exact book, but it's large print. Run with it. Um, right. I think giving our students choice and having them pick, like if you want the quote unquote regular print, go ahead. Right. But if you want to read it in large print, there's nothing wrong with that. And mm -hmm. honestly, like, you're still reading. As long as you're reading, like, I have no qualms. Right. Um, so thank you for that. I think we're going to move to um, Kate. And you have written a number of books. Many of them are my favorites. Um, <laughs> Tana. So Death Row is, like, my heart. So, um, and you've also won awards writing novels that students and adults love. So question for you is, what is the first book that made you think differently about reading and why? 
Oh boy. Well, as I said, I was super lucky in that I grew up in a household where my mother read to me and uh, we had a, a golden book, uh, this lavishly illustrated unabridged Pinocchio golden book with these really um, compelling illustrations in it that my mother read to me. Um, and, and then I have this memory of once I learned to read, um, reading it aloud to my mother um, and and she was doing, she was reading the newspaper and she looked up as I was reading aloud to her from this Pinocchio book. And she said, uh, that's good, Kate, you're a good reader. And my mother wasn't somebody who gave idle compliments. And, um, and that was when I fully embraced that this is who I, was was a reader and there you know there are all these challenging words in that unabridged uh, edition of Pinocchio and I just uh, you know made my way through it and in and, and the lavishness of the, il the illustrations but the lavishness of the words and I just um I I you know when we were talking earlier about um large print it was just interesting for me to hear from y'all the professionals right because you think that large print has to be for somebody who does you know but I what I was thinking as you were saying all that was that I am such a reader I I'm I'm mostly I, my truest self when I'm reading a book and uh, and my happiest self but it's funny to me that um, a dense page of text is intimidating even to me somebody who loves words, who rejoices in story, is if I look at something that is nothing but dense text, um, I, I think, when's the end of this chapter? When does this, when does this, you know, long? And so I just think it is, um, it is an individual journey, right? And everybody, in, and it's a way to know yourself. And every book helps me know myself better and also know myself better as a reader and understand other readers better too. I was the kind of kid who I didn't know was book talking, but like I was the kind of kid who was always trying to make other kids read a book that I loved. And I, I had a couple that I knew I was going to succeed with. One was Pippi Longstocking, the most reluctant reader in the world would say, yes, thank you very much. And the other was the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil Franklin, right? And so I knew I could put those books into a kid's hands and they would say that was great I, or then later on Edgar Allan Poe was always a winner too okay all right I'm done now I, I won't I won't say anymore but it's just fascinating to me to think about how because it's it's my job then it's y'all's job to like usher the readers into this experience right that's what we want to do is we want to bring them in and there are so many different ways to do that and, and it's seeing people as individuals because every individual needs a different thing to bring them in. Okay, Donna, I really am done now, I promise. Promise, promise. <laughs> we wanna hear from you, Kate, please. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's, but it's fascinating to me to talk, but like the large print discussion from y'all was just amazing to me. And it was just not how I had thought about it. And it made me think, so, okay. I think to your point about dense text, like there are some books that I really want to read. And then I look at it, and I'm like, that's 600 pages. And it has to be an audio book for me. But I, and I can, I can do it as an audio, but some series, as you go along in the series, they get, they get larger and more pages. And it's just, I don't have the capacity to sit because it's, it's daunting. And I'm an adult and I'm a librarian. I should want to pick up the 600 page tome. And I don't. I want to get an audiobook and put it at 1.5 so I can listen to it quicker. Um, Cause that's, that's how I, that's how I read. That's how you can keep me engaged. And I think you spoke about golden books, um, the, the Pinocchio golden book and that the cover and the look of it. And also maybe even the difficulty of it. That's what kept you engaged, right? When you think about the books in your collection, what do you take into consideration to ensure that your students are engaged? Like, I don't think you have, um, a whole bunch of Pinocchio golden books, but <laughs> how do you keep students engaged in your in your library? So I think when when we're talking about ensuring engagement, 
um, you really have to try and pick the right books. And I feel like there is a bit of an art to, to picking books for your students. I've been doing this now for over 20 years. So it is a skill that you have to develop, but it is completely attainable, I think. Um, first off, I have to know my students and more importantly, what middle school students seem to be interested in. And I say seem because sometimes they don't appear to know what they are interested in. I find that a lot more now when I ask a kid, they come up, I don't know what to read. I'm like, okay, fine. Well, what do you like? Nothing. Okay, well, <laughs> and I used to say, what movies do you watch? Well, I don't watch movies. Okay, what TV shows? Nope, don't do TV shows anymore. Okay, what TikTok videos do you like to watch? You know, so you try and gauge what they're interested in. And I know fads come and go, but I have to say, I've been working with middle school kids for over 20 years. And they are still pretty much the same, you know, how they get their information may have changed, uh, but they are still at their core, they are pretty much the same. So for me as a librarian, and I'm guessing you feel the same way, Donna. It's super important for me to read, read, read. I, I just have to read. Um, now, this has been hard for me for some reason last couple of years. I don't know what it was about COVID, but I think it just depressed everyone. <laughs> so so I, weird, oddly enough, I just didn't read a lot during COVID. So I'm really trying to slug my way back into it. Um, I try to set a goal for myself to read 50 middle school books a year. Honestly, there are quite a few years where I fall short, um, but I love to read. And then I have to rec reading and recommending the books is the best way for me to know what students like. And it's just as important for me to hear books they don't like as it is to hear what they do like, because that really helps me fine tune my selection process to try and find books that are going to be engaging to the students. Now, because I work in a middle school, I do have to be aware of the content. I am in a seventh and eighth grade school, uh, so I need reviews. I, I look at reviews and I, I do pretty much work off of them and what sounds appealing to my students based on the storyline. I think if I think a book will appeal to my students, I do tend to buy multiple copies because I like to book talk them and I want the kids to have that ability to check the books out. I don't want to just have one copy and talk about it and only be able to service that one child. Variety of content just like variety in formats is incredibly important in terms of engagement. I have to offer many different genres to the students. And I did make the leap into genre-fying my collection this year. I had been fighting it for several years. Kids were always coming up to me saying, where's the mystery section? I'm like, I don't have a mystery section. <laughs> it's alphabetized by the author's last name, you know, but they're like two minutes later, they'd be like, where's the historical fiction section? Okay, guys, I'm, I'm done fighting this. Um, and when I found out the high school that they're going to go into next year, genre fied during COVID, I'm like, okay. And I did a quick survey. 80% of the kids wanted it genre fied. Fine, fine. I will genre fy it. But still, I have to make sure that I have a variety of uh, in characters, viewpoints, and lives lived, because that's really important if I want all of my students to see themselves represented in the library and in stories that speak to them. All of these factors, I feel, play into engaging students in reading. Thank you for that. And it's so hard with middle school sometimes. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're so funny <laughs> like middle school is the best to teach and also to have in the library because they are so excited about reading but in some ways you're like oh I don't know what you want I know, they don't either <laughs> That's, <laughs> like seriously I have no clue. so here are five books that I think you might like um, yeah and yeah it's trial and error right and I think with it really is it really yeah. is you and just I, have to try and I tell my kids like I'm not married to the book so if you don't right. like it, it's okay to return it. You don't have to finish it. I used to try to finish all the books that I started and I stopped that madness because if you don't like it, um, but you have to get through the exposition. Once you get through all the characters and you're like, ah, it's not for me, that's okay. Yeah, I, mean, I like yeah. I've told them that many times. I'm like, there are way too many books. I, I, I do the caveat for the teachers. Unless the teacher's requiring you to read the book. I said, you do not need to finish this book. There are so many books out there. Why would you force yourself to read a book that you're not enjoying? And I think if we set our kids up with that expectation or they think they have to do that, that's how we turn them off from being readers too, right? If they, they don't like it. 
drudgery then, right? Right, and, and right. I, I think it's also a really interesting point that to, if they can come back and tell you why they didn't like, or even like you said, what they didn't like, right? Um, it's like, it helps so much. And it's like, it does. sometimes I will um, read a book that I am not enjoying and that I, I think is not good in order to try and figure out why um, it's not working. Mm -hmm. And, and that's similar exactly to, you know, and it's like, once I can figure that out, then I can, I can put it down. And so it's just like it, it, the same as if a kid can tell you why it does not work for them, then that's a clue to what, what does work for them. You know? The other thing is even when they do give a, they'll say, Oh, I'll say, well, what book did you like? Or what book didn't you like? Cause that will help me. And sometimes they'll tell me a book that they liked. And so then I have to parse it apart. Well, was it, was it the romance that you liked in that book? Or was it the mystery little part in there? Or was it the friendship that you liked? Because sometimes kids gravitate towards some little part, or was it, was it because of a particular character in the book? You know, so there can be so many different levels. And I think sometimes people miss that. They don't know exactly. Kids can't articulate that to you. And so the better you are at having read a lot of books, the better you are at able to pick apart and figure out what it was that spoke to them about that book. And can I just say one more thing, Donna? I know that I'm like stepping into, but it's just, it's interesting to me no. to, to think that um, that it's like when you're asking that question of a reader, um, did, what did you like about it? And did this work or did that work? That another thing is happening too, which is that you're forming a bond, you mm -hmm. know? Oh, yeah. And to me, that, that is so much the miracle of story and putting a book in somebody's hands is just like you're getting to know each other as that and 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 the kid is getting to trust you mm -hmm. um and it's like it's so important that give and take and talking about what what moved somebody in a book or what didn't move them okay. and i think it's i think it's okay to sorry this is a good conversation yeah. <laughs> i think it's i think it's really good also that kids don't feel the pressure that you feel like they have to be an amazing reader. Cause so I was talking with sixth graders today and there was a kid that came up to me and I'm like, so would you consider yourself? Do you enjoy reading? Do you not enjoy reading? Do you kind of consider yourself a reader? And he's like, no, not really. I'm like, okay, next year we're going to work on that. I'm going to show you as already like, I'm going to show you some of my quick read books. And I think you might like them. And he went over and told the other library and he's like, I kind of like her. How long have you known her? <laughs> She's like, I've known her 11 years, you know, but you know, it, so I feel like I've already opened the door a little crack with that student by saying, Hey, it's okay. If you don't like to read, I get you. I understand that we have to find the right book for you, you know? And it takes the pressure off. I think, um, yes, I was an avid reader. And when I got into my first library, I was like, well, doesn't everyone love to read? Like, <laughs> like, and when I realized that they didn't, it was, it, it, I moved to, you just haven't found the right book. And once you find the right book, because you're going to love it, but we just, we just have to go through all these other books. And if you don't like this one, fine, let's pick a different book. But there are so many different, like to your, to your, to your point about not finishing a, a, a book you don't like, there's so many books out there. Like don't box yourself in and say, well, I'm going to finish this one. Stay. I can read whatever I want. So some people are more, I'm not, more nonfiction and that's all they read. I mean, good for you. Like there's so much nonfiction out there, go for it. And even if I have friends who are not readers, sadly, but I mean, you could do a podcast, you can read articles. Like there, there are other ways to engage with the, with, uh, with the world as opposed to hardcore reading. Like there's space for everyone. I, I, that's that's yes. how I see it. Yes, yes. Um, so this is really good conversation. Um, and I want to ask Kate, thinking, because we were talking about students. Um, so thinking about teachers and parents, um, what would you suggest to the adults um, to encourage students to read besides reading all of your amazing books? <laughs> you, um, you know, uh, back in uh, the day when I would, you know, was out on the road and talking to, to people all the time, um, and, and parents and children, you know, in a room together. And it's like, what can I do to make my kid read? And to me, the first answer always is um, let them see you reading for your, your own pleasure. 
And, and the, the other thing I think is really necessary is like when somebody says, what can I do to make my kid read? That's, you know, uh, that's already an alarming sentence. It's like, it's not, there is so much, it, it is, it, it's a privilege one to be able to do it. It is a, an unimaginable privilege to walk into a library and to ask somebody to help you find a book. I mean, I, don't, I, I wish I could put that into the context in history for every kid. I mean, like the miracle of that, that you can go into a library and ask for a book and somebody will help you find a book and, and will bend over backwards to find a book for you. I mean, that it's such a privilege. And then there's just joy in it. And I think that we get so worried about kids reading the way that we want them to read that we, we forget about really this privilege and joy. And, and that's kind of what I feel my job is, is to remind people of that, that it is a privilege and a joy. And then this whole discussion that we're having about, like there's so many different ways to come to the table. Um, and so it, don't be rigid in thinking that you, you, know, you only have to read literary fiction. You only have to read nonfiction. It's just like, no, come to the, bring yourself to the table. There is something at this table for you, I guarantee it. And, um, and, and that kind of thing, that all embracing kind of thing, I think is what we all need to do. And then, like I said, it's just like, you cannot send your kid off to the, uh, their room to, you go read for 15 minutes. Um, no, you know, read, if you, if you're not reading for yourself, you can read with your child. And that is like a profound experience for a family to read together way past the point where kids quote unquote need to be read to read to your high schoolers, read together as a family, read aloud. So, okay. Off the soapbox now, I promise. <laughs> no, get back on it. I think, I think just the idea of reading as a family is important and reading reading as a unit, no matter what that unit is. So like reading in school, um, I do, I listen to audiobooks because I like being read to as well. I am a yes. girl on most days and I, I like having the book read to me. I, it's the, the narrator, if it's a really great audio, it's just like, wow, like this is, to your point, it's, it's a privilege to actually hear this. It's like a piece of, piece of art. So yes. to, hear, to hear this thing, it's like, wow, like, this is amazing. And I think if you frame it in the way that you're saying that it's a privilege and an honor to be able to do this thing, I think it changes the dynamic as opposed to saying, how do I make my kid read? Because right. do you make someone do anything you don't, um, not anything that, they, that they're going to do beyond you standing over them. And we want to have lifelong readers and learners. And to do that, they need to be engaged on their own, um, but they also need training wheels and we are the training wheel. So like they can read to us, at us, um, during dinner, after dinner. Um, so yeah, I think making it a privilege and not a task is super important. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so Tasha, I know you have middle schoolers and before they were in middle school, obviously they were in the lower grades. So how, um, in your experience, has accessibility been part of your intro to novels to your students? So I guess when I look at the word accessibility and I think about it in terms of our students and our readers and my library, I look at it as there are two parts to accessibility. So the first part to me is do the students actually have physical access to books? <laughs> Um, can they get them in a physical space like a library or online? Um, do they have a classroom space that has books in it? Uh, so to me, I know when I started this school, it was really important that the classroom libraries got built up. And it also was important that the books were selected with their age level in mind and the content in mind. I know I think a lot of times I, I feel bad for the elementary teachers who maybe have been in a particular grade for several years and have built up their classroom library and then they get moved to a different grade and they're like, no, <laughs> I have this classroom library. Now what do I do with it? It seems to happen more in elementary school than in the, than the upper grades. But 
But I also then see sometimes those teachers want to stay with a book that they say loved teaching in sixth grade. And they're like, oh, I could still use this with third grade. And I think that sometimes our love for a material blinds us to maybe the appropriateness and the accessibility for the kids in that way. Um, and I, I think we have to be careful about that because we really don't want to turn kids off to reading if we give them something that's too above them or, or too low for them. So even if a school has a school library, um, it does the students no good if the kids don't come down to it. And I think as educators, it's really imperative that we make the time to get our students to the library. And in this day and age, when we keep hearing about libraries being cut and library programs going, we have to show the administrators that we're actually using the physical space that is housing the physical books. Um, and I think that's really important. And librarians obviously can work with teachers to create schedules for checkout. And I know this isn't as big a deal in elementary schools, but I feel like it's something that sometimes gets overlooked in middle schools when they're not the release time for the, the teachers. And even in high schools, I mean, make that schedule, set up the regular checkout time with the teachers. So that's the first part for accessibility, like the physical books, you know, getting access to them. The second to me is, can they access it? Can they read it? Can they understand it? Um, and this is to me has, I would say within the last five or six years become really interesting to me. Um, and that's why I have so many different formats, especially after seeing, I started really delving into large print uh, about five or six years ago with my students and seeing the dramatic difference in the kids just, I, I didn't expect it. Honestly, I, I truly did not expect it. And once I had introduced them to it and started to see the high demand that the kids had for this and how they were able to access the material in a different way, that was really surprising to me. I had a kid come in the other day and he went to my little quick read section and he grabbed a couple and he had just returned some. And I'm like, oh, these are really great, aren't they? And he goes, yeah. He's like, I've gone through a whole bunch of them. Now, these are second to fourth grade reading levels. Okay, I serve seventh and eighth grade kids, but I have kids that are reading at second grade reading level in my school. That kid now looks at himself as a reader because he's been successful. And he, if I had given him a 400 page book, even if it had content he was interested in, he would have probably been discouraged. He might have lied to me and said, Oh, yeah, I read it, but I just didn't like it. Whereas I gave him something. And a lot of times it's reading their body language too. Do you find that Donna? Like, like you can tell if you say the wrong thing to them, like, okay, let's switch gears. We're going to try something else. And, and just by steering them in a little different way, you can, you can change that whole thing. And like I said, I've definitely seen this with large print. The, the things that I've seen with large print is the students tell me this is what is amazing to me. They volunteered this information to me and it shocked me that they could read for longer periods of time when they were using large print. They could, this killed me. They could remember more of the book <laughs> and they understood it more. That was shocking to me. I never would have thought that. So we started investigating this more and now we have a unit where in seventh grade, they're introduced to large print books. They have to read a historical fiction book. So after they've read this historical fiction book in large print, then we do the outsiders. And so this year and last year during COVID, it was a little more sketchy last year, but this year I had a card out and the kids were coming down and they could pick regular print. Well, my kids call it small print. <laughs> I'm like, guys, just regular print, but they call it small print. <laughs> so I'm like, you can pick the outsiders in regular or large print. I had them both sitting there. It was completely up to them. I said, here's the card of books. Over 50% of the kids picked the large print book. Wow. They just picked it up on their own. There was nothing for me. They do self-checkout. There was nothing like, oh, you should try large print. Individually, they, over 50% of the kids pick that. And then talking about wonder books, I'm so glad you guys have those, Donna. Like, I'm super excited about these. So I did a quick little survey with, cause I got some wonder books, was really excited. And I did a survey with one class and 30% of those kids said they would like to have a book that they can listen to as they're reading at the same time. 
And so when we talk about, I know I talked a lot about accessibility, but I do think it's really important um, when we're looking at getting reading right for all the students, because there are two components to accessibility, and I think they're both really important. Thank you for that. And I just, the last thing you said just makes so much sense to me um, in regards to the Wonder Books, because I, when I taught middle school, there was a teacher who did um, popcorn reading. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so we shouldn't be doing this because mm -hmm. not every student can comprehend and has the right inflection. So I immediately adopted. I did all your books in middle, in middle school because as a teacher in middle school, you want to have five eyes on your students. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Six um, or seven and exactly. half in the back of your head. Yeah. <laughs> so we were like, not going to be helpful because I'd be looking down and they could be having a circus. So I would play the audio and if you can hear the inflection and if you can hear how the word should sound and then see the right. word, those two now yes. together, right? Yes. So and super also, important. Super. And I think to the point of large print, I don't know what it is about large print, but well, I do know what I do know what it is. It's, <laughs> it's almost because I wear glasses. And if I have large print, like it's easier on the eyes. Like my eyes are like and if, it if is. your body and your eyes are relaxed, then I think you can retain a lot more, right? Like it's just, yes. there's, no, well, there's no more stress. And, and also look, I, like, like, I know, you can jump in, Kate. <laughs> wow. Okay. But also I think, you know, back to that thing where I think of my, I am a reader. It's where I'm my truest self, blah, blah, blah. I'm also somebody who likes to make progress. Mm. And so oh, like yes. when you have large print, it's just like, mm -hmm. it's the same way I feel about like when there are short chapters, it's mm -hmm. just like, man, I am moving here. I am making progress. And you can, it, you can feel it. There's a, there's, there's a rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I would imagine that large print would provide that same thing where it's just like, you feel that sense of accomplishment. You're moving and, yes. and, and you're, you're in it, you're in the flow of it, you know? Um, and so that's what you're right, Kate. And that's what kids actually told me. And Donna, to your point about relaxing. So I, when I started getting into large print, I actually videotaped several, quite a few kids, about 10 to 15 kids, all varieties, reading the books, some that had learning disabilities and others that did not. And their physical bodies relaxed when they had the large print in front of them. One girl actually slowed down her reading and began to read with inflection. And I, one boy stopped stuttering when he had it. He was so funny. He had so much to tell me about why he liked dark, large print. I mean, he was like, he's like, I can take my glass off. I can put him on. The other thing is I feel like I have noticed, I think we have a lot of undiagnosed eye issues with kids. Yeah. And, and I think that that's why they gravitate understandably. So toward the large print, but yeah, <laughs> it's really, it's really fascinating what happens when you give a book that's accessible to kids, you know, I think, I, I think you're spot on to all your points, especially the, the undiagnosed eye issues. A lot of our students, the can't afford, don't realize right. Um, don't want the embarrassment. I didn't wear glasses in middle high school. And I was like, I don't wear glasses. Who wants to wear glasses? And now I own like 30 pairs of them, but <laughs> <laughs> all different colors, right? <laughs> colors, different, different shades. Um, so I want to move because we don't have a lot of time left and I'm going to miss you guys. Um, so question I have for Kate is how do current events and issues facing today's youth, um, impact or affect your writing process? Um, and it's a long question, but you can answer any part of it you want. So then another section is, do your own reading habits um, impact how you write? And then how do these two things complement or contrast? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it, you know, it, it's, uh, it is a solitary task. Uh, writing stories. It's just like, and, and there's so much, you know, the, uh, during COVID and when we were, you know, absolutely, you know, um, shut down and uh, you would think, what difference does it make if I get up and, and write a story or not? And, and I found that it was actually a way for me to 
even though I'm not literally connecting, I, I still felt like it was really important for me to come down each morning and write those stories um, and and feel like I was connecting to kids, even though it would be so long before these stories are in their their hands. And so it's like, it, and the stories that I write um, don't necessarily have to do with what is going on in the world, but they do have to do very much, I think, with what it means to be a human being in the world and how we move through the world um, broken hearted um and and this is the way we all are now and stories let us um give us a place to come together to address that that grief and i feel like there's as a storyteller it's odd to say that i feel like my job is to tell the truth but it's 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 i think it's more important than ever to tell the, the truth of what it means to be a human being and, um, and that then will connect to somebody that I never, ever even meet, but, but we will be more human together through story. So that is always at the back of my mind. And as far as what I read and how it informs what I write, um, I immerse myself in language all the time. And it was interesting to me, Tasha, that you said it was hard for you to read uh, over the last couple of years. And I felt like it, what I did was I wasn't, uh, casting myself out to new stuff, I was going back to all of these books that I had, you know, I did so much rereading and I feel like I would not have survived without those books. It helped to, to ground me and to bring me, you know, those stories that I knew so well and I thought that I knew so well. Um, I just went back and, and reread them and got all new kinds of stuff out of them and they sustained me. Um, and so uh, that language and all of the, the writers that I've connected to who I will never meet, uh, all of that language, it gets to be a conversation and those conversations show up in the stories that I then tell. Does that kind of answer it, Dinah? Is that like, does that, you, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like having a conversation with the past and with the invisible present here of the kids that will, you know. And I, I like your point about learning like your books are like basically lessons to learn how to be human. Um, yes. To learn about the human experience. And I mean, you can learn about the human experience through a courageous little mouse as well. So like, it doesn't have to be exactly what's happening in our current time, but you can learn like how to have character, how to be brave when you're really afraid. And those things, you can learn how to apply them to your current situation, wherever you are. So I think I think it's spot on. Um, and that's what I think as a librarian, there are so many other genres out there, but I, I like when students can walk away from any book and figure out how to be a better them. Like, yes. so even if the, there's a villain in the character that they really love, that's fine. But how can you figure out how to be a better you? A better you and, 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 and part of that better you, and this is we all, we all know this is just not only a better you, but a you that is able to see other people better and to imagine their lives better. And that empathy um, of like, wait a minute, every person that I'm walking past has got a story and um, I don't know it. But you know, it's that, it's that, that, that quote about be kind for everyone you meet is carrying a weary burden. Um, and it, it, and stories give us access to other people's lives. And then you look at every person you meet differently because you think, well, this person has this story and I, I don't know it, right? But you can know it through a book. Okay, Tasha, I'm sorry. It's just, I see you, I see you agreeing. And, and I, Donna, I know that you- agree. I am agreeing, yeah, yeah 100%. Just, that's how we can, yeah. we, we become a better, we become better ourselves because I always feel like that's what books help me do is like know myself better and become my better self. And part of becoming my better self is imagining other people's lives better. So well, and that's the magic of stories, right? And empathy, I think so important for us to live vicariously through other people's lives and to experience, Hey, what that might be like. Yeah. And that's the beauty of stories. Yeah. I I really feel like 
that is the most important part about the work that we do. That's how we engage our students. That's how we bring our fellow colleagues into the library to have them realize, hey, like, this is a good place to be. Um, we have we have all the books. You don't have all the answers and we can, like, work on figuring it out together. I'm so grateful to talk with both of you and, and, uh, and I, I feel like I've learned so much. And also I just like, I, I uh, you know, everybody can come to the table and that's, you know, and, and to talk a, a, about bringing everybody in to this magical world of books and what an honor it is to, to get to do this for a living. Thank you for, thank both of you for all of your work. This has just been a really great session. Um, so I hope that people leave with tips and tricks on how to get reading right for all students um, and have a great day and take care and be well. <laughs>